You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. I personally purchased 375,000 shares uh, in the last two months, and I'll likely be adding to that position in the near term as well. And we still feel that uh, there's lots of value to be had with respect to the story and, uh, uh, and the assets that we have in terms of our interest in the Amblin Mining District. In today's episode, you are going to be getting an update from Tony Giardini. He is at the helm of Trilogy Metals, one of our sponsors. The website is TrilogyMetals.com to learn more information. And the ticker symbol on the big boards in Toronto and in New York is TMQ. Tony, welcome back onto the show. It's been several months since we had an update. And uh, perhaps we could start off with uh, you providing your commentary on copper. Copper is one of the best six months charts when you look across the commodities sector. What do you think is going on here with copper? Uh, Bill, first of all, thanks for having us on the show. And uh, it has been a while. A lot's happened at Trilogy. So it'd be a good opportunity to update you and the listeners on uh, what's what's going on. Um, as you say, copper's had a great run. Uh, I looked at the uh, price this morning and it was over 340 on the futures, selling back down to just below 340 now. But, you know, overall for the year, it's up around uh, uh, 20%, 22%. Uh, so it's 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 really performing well. In fact, after silver, copper is the best performing metal out there. I and mean, gold's come off a bit, uh, but uh, but we're continuing to see very strong performance in 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 copper. And I think um, there's a lot of things at play. I, I think you know obviously COVID's had an impact in terms of the supply side, uh, in, in particularly in Peru and in Chile, in terms of uh, supply of a metal that's had an impact. But I think as people are starting to think uh, to the future and thinking about uh, as we come out of COVID and the vaccines start to get rolled out, uh, what's going to happen from a growth point of view. And uh, clearly that's weighing on people's mind and, and people are looking at the structural deficits within the, the copper market, thinking about what copper demand trends are going to look like and, and, and supply. And those things are all having uh, a big impact in terms of the current spot price. What's interesting is if you look at 2021, I just looked at uh, some consensus estimates for 2021. And people are still thinking that copper is going to stay around $3. In fact, the highest estimate that I saw on the list that I look at was Morgan Stanley, which had it at $3.36, which is below the current spot price right now. So uh, I, I don't think that uh, the market has yet adjusted its view in terms of what people expect for copper heading into uh, 2021. And you know, my view is the future is very bright for the metal simply because of those you know, key points that I uh, talked about, uh, which is really the demand side. And, and this is before you start to factor in changes that are gonna be happening in terms of electrification of a grid uh, as we move more away from uh, coal to, to other sources of uh, a power generation. And you start to look at electric vehicles and uh, how prevalent they become. And you know, you're in Michigan and you know what's happening in the auto space. And I see that you know, Ford's rolling out uh, their uh, trucks in electric form. And I think a lot more uh, efforts going to be put into electric vehicles, not just um, in the US, but everywhere. And uh, for anyone that does a bit of research, they'll see that the amount of copper used in electric vehicle is significantly more than what's used in, in uh, gasoline powered uh, or ICE vehicles. So um, I, I think the future is very bright for copper and uh, we're very excited about uh, the, the, the prospects going forward. Tony, as you know, in the junior mining sector, especially, especially early stage exploration companies really need uh, upward moving commodity price to be able to raise funds. But one of the things you mentioned to me in a previous interview is that with Trilogy, you're not effective and affected by, in a negative way, the near term price movements and the price of copper because you have funding now for many years and you're, you're a medium to long term play on, on the price of copper. But with that being said, investors like myself even sometimes get impatient and then we say, hey, copper's rallying, but maybe Trilogy isn't moving as much as I would like it to. Could you provide some color here on this for investors that are thinking in these terms? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a very pertinent question. In fact, I had a call with it, one of our large investors last week, and, and that was the gist of a conversation where they were trying to understand what's happened with the copper moving and the share price has sort of been languishing somewhat. I think there's a couple of things that, at, at play. I think, you know, with the initial copper move, investors are looking at some of the larger players out there. So we're seeing, you know, 52-week highs in companies like uh, Freeport, uh, First Quantum, uh, Lundin, and that's natural because they have existing copper exposure and they're focused on uh, those uh, names. They haven't really uh, trickled down into the developer names yet. And our expectation is that as that happens and people start to look at um, uh, Trilogy, uh, they'll re uh, recognize a disconnect in terms of where the copper price is and what uh, you know our portfolio of assets looks like at higher copper prices. So I think that's one consideration in terms of why we've languished somewhat. Secondly, I think the, the other point is we didn't have a drill campaign this year. And that's a big determinant in terms of how people look at the developer space is they're always looking for news relative to, you know, drill results, how the resource is doing, uh, you know, having something to talk about with respect to expanding the resource. We chose not to have a, a drill campaign in 2020 because of COVID. We were very concerned about bringing the virus into the native communities where we operate. And it was gonna be a truncated season so we, we felt that it was best to focus on 2021 so as a result we didn't have a field campaign so we haven't had any results to uh, talk about even though when we look at our performance during the year in terms of key milestones we've had a number of them uh, as you well know in terms of the formation of the JV uh, the record of decision on the road and the feasibility study that we released earlier this year so I think those are two of the determining factors. I see it as personally a buying opportunity. And I can tell you that recently there was a large block of shares that traded and I participated in sort of clearing that uh, block. I acquired 200,000 shares personally, my own cash. And uh, since uh, basically the last two months, I've added a total of 375,000 shares personally to my own account. So I'm uh, very focused on the story and I'm personally invested. And I think this is a great opportunity uh, to uh, purchase these shares at, at a price that makes a lot of sense, uh, and particularly a discount to uh, the, the real value of uh, what we believe uh, Trilogy should be. Since we last spoke, you, as you said, you put out the Arctic feasibility study. Could you give us a thumbnail overview of some of the key highlights with that study? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think we were very pleased with the study. It was, uh, you know, a really good result. Um, it came on the back of a, a FS or a PFS that we did in 2018. So what we did was we held the base metal prices uh, constant from 2018, and we kept uh, that uh, the same. And what we ended up seeing was an MPV of 1.1 billion dollars on an after-tax basis using an eight percent discount rate. We saw cash costs after byproduct credits of uh, 32 cents and we saw an IRR of roughly 27 percent. Uh, the other number that I like to look at is called the capital intensity and that's the amount of capital that you need to produce a copper equivalent ton and for Trilogy at, uh, for Arctic it sits at roughly $6,400 which is quite low. So I think you know, we've had excellent results in, in terms of a feasibility study. And what's happened now is we've taken those study results and we've passed them on to uh, Ambler Metals, which is a JV company that is overseeing the development of Arctic and really the development of a district. So they're going to be uh, focused on the next phase of development there. The other thing that I would, you know, highlight, we talked about the higher copper prices. And uh, I just looked at our presentation on our website, which you mentioned earlier, trilogymetals.com. And we had a feasibility study presentation that we did when we released this study. And in there, we have a chart that just shows the sensitivity of the MPV and the IRR to changes in the copper price. So at you know $3.50, which we're not far from right now, the MPV increases uh, to $1.5 billion uh, without adjusting anything for uh, gold price or silver increases. So that's a 36% increase from uh, what we reported at uh, uh, in August with respect to using a $3 gold price. And the IRR is over 30%. So I think we look at it and we sit there and say, we've got a great result at the spot prices that we use, which are below current spot prices. And we think it sets us up very well in terms of how we're looking at the project uh, going forward. 
And I think a key thing to point out to investors, you mentioned uh, this study and the net present value. You also have a Boronite project, which is at the, the study stage. But this district and what you see going on here geologically, you're looking at multiple deposits, aren't you? I mean, what's really exciting about where we're at is, and, and, and this is one of the things that we get into the rabbit hole of talking about Arctic because it's the most advanced project. But, you know, the real key to the trilogy story and the Ambler Mining District is really uh, the opportunity to um, expand the resources at a number of other deposits. So in and around uh, Arctic, there's uh, three or four other known deposits that we've identified that in total uh, are roughly 35 million tons of resources, not at the same grade, high grade that we have at Arctic, but we've already identified roughly 35 uh, million historical tons there. So what we're gonna be focused on in terms of a campaign later this year is really doing additional drilling at some of those deposits. So that's Sunshine, uh, Horse Creek, uh, Center of the Universe, uh, Shunak, BT. Those are the names that we've given to these anomalies that we've identified. And we see significant opportunities to extend the mine life. So right now, Arctic has a 12 year mine life in terms of a feasibility study. If we look at those 34 and a half million tons and we're able to convert those into resources that can be processed through the Arctic mill, we're talking to at least another 10 years of uh, mine life uh, at Arctic. And obviously that will go a long way to further improving the economics of the development. And you, know, you mentioned Bornite. And we haven't spent a lot of time talking about Bornite. I had one of the geologists in our office come in and talk to me the other day. And he was pointing to a press release that was issued in 2011 when uh, uh, Nova Gold or when Trilogy was part of Nova Gold at the time before we had been spun out. And in 2011, we drilled uh, 35 meters at 12% copper at Bornite. We also had 11.8 meters at 7.5% co copper. We had a total drill length of 178 meters at 4% copper at Bornite. So people forget about what Bornite is. And in total, Bornite is 182 million tons of, uh, of resource at 1.6% copper, which is a very high grade for a copper deposit. So part of our focus going forward will really be to demonstrate the tremendous value that Bornite has as far as not just the existing resource, but the potential to expand that significantly. So when you look at the share price right now, and I know we're going to talk about enterprise value, but if you look at the share price, there's really no value being attributed to assets like Bornite and some of these satellite deposits adjacent to Arctic. Mm -hmm. And I think we should point out too, because we're talking about Alaska, obviously in the news this last week was Northern Dynasty, their share price was cut in half because of a negative ruling on their, their pebble project. But there's no political baggage associated with your project whatsoever, is there? None whatsoever. And I mean, uh, we're, we don't, uh, uh, you know, we don't compare ourselves to other companies operating in Alaska. Our focus is really on the Ambler Mining District. And we think there's a couple of things that differentiate us. One is we have a native corporation as a partner, that's NANA. So we're very closely tied to NANA and the Northwest Arctic Borough, which is the assembly that oversees the villages in the district. We're very in tune with what's happening in the, those communities and we engage with them on a regular basis and we believe we have a support of those communities as well as NANA in terms of advancing the project as well. I would also point uh, your listeners to the Department of Transportation press release that was issued after the record of decision came out on the road and in that press release you'll see that all of the politicians within the state of Alaska, whether uh, in, at the Senate level, at Congress, or the governor, all were very positive about the potential of opening up the Ambler Mining District through the development of the road. And uh, we believe that uh, regardless of whether uh, there's a new administration in Washington, there's been a uh, key indication that there's a need to have domestic sources of key metals like copper, like zinc, like cobalt. And those are right down the center of a fairway for the Ambler Mining District because those are the metals that are there. So we feel we're in a really strong position to advance our projects. We feel we have the support of NANA and the native communities where we operate. We feel that the state is there and uh, we, we think we're in a very strong position vis-a-vis uh, -vis where we're going. And as you pointed out, we're well-funded. So right now, now we're in a position where uh, at the Ambler Metals level, we likely will have sufficient funds to fund our programs and development out to 2024, 2025, possibly. 
Yep, and you're well-funded because of your partnership with South 32. Could you talk to us with this partnership with South 32 for the Ambler JV? What's your plans, budget, and goals for the upcoming year? Yeah, it's... Um... It's, it's progressing and it's, it's a timely question. We just released a press release that uh, indicated our budget for next year is $27 million. Uh, that includes uh, 7,600 meters of infill drilling at Arctic, 7,000 uh, uh, meters of exploration drilling at other targets. We're gonna be commencing uh, or advancing engineering activities further with respect to the study work that Trilogy had done. As I've indicated, we've taken that study, we've provided it to Ambler Metals. Ambler will start to look at that and they're gonna be focused on water management tailing management issues and really allowing us to advance the engineering further so we're in a position to start the permitting process sometime next year and the permitting process is really the key uh, a, a factor in terms of moving this project forward to an investment decision so the sooner we get the permitting process underway the more quickly we can get to a point where we can make an investment decision on the project so all of that is um, going to be hand in glove as far as this budget goes for next year and the benefit of a relationship with South 32 is that South 32 effectively funded $145 million into uh, Ambler Metals. We're well funded for the uh, next uh, four years, at least possibly five. It puts us in a strong position to conduct exploration in the district where in the past we, we haven't had the financial resources to be able to do that. And we can also advance the development of Arctic and start to think about some of the other opportunities in the district as we go forward. So it's, it's really exciting time for us. And uh, we think that we're uniquely positioned to be able to advance these projects in a very measured fashion uh, that demonstrates you know, how valuable these assets are. I think one of the things that people lose sight of is you know, people talk about higher grade deposits being 0.7% copper. And when we look at Arctic on a standalone basis, it's over 4% copper equivalent. So we've got some very great deposits up there. We've got a great partner in South 32 and we feel like we're gonna hit the ground running for next year. And the last point that I'd like to make Bill is just on, on COVID. We're obviously very focused on COVID protocols for next year to ensure that we operate safely uh, at the camp and within the community. So we're putting those in place now so that when we start the field program, and the, the, the season for next year in May that uh, we'll have all of the checks and balances in place, whether the vaccines have been distributed or not at that point. Tony, for the value investors that are listening to us, what is your enterprise value relative to your 50% interest in the Ambler joint venture with South 32? Yeah, it's a great question. And the uh, market cap's roughly right now $250 million based on the current share price. It's $1.75 US. If you strip out the cash, we haven't really used, uh, we've only used a small portion of the cash at the JV level. So when we take our JV stake and um, the cash that it sits at uh, the trilogy level, that's roughly $13 million. So in aggregate, that's $85 million. So it implies an enterprise value of $165 million for our 50% interest in Ambler Metals or the Ambler Mining District. So how do you benchmark that against the underlying values uh, that we've talked about? So if you look at uh, Arctic on a standalone basis and we just adjust for copper price, we don't adjust for gold or silver, we're talking about a $1.5 billion MPB which means that on a 50% basis, we would have $750 million of that. If you want to look at it a little differently and say, well, how does it compare to what South 32 has invested? South 32 has invested over $200 million so far to earn their 50% interest. That $200 million comprises $145 million in cash. They invested $30 million in um, exploration expenditures uh, over a three-year time period to earn that interest. And they own 11.5% of a stock which they bought in the open market. So in total, South 32 has paid uh, $200 million in excess. So if you compare that to the 165, there's still a $35 million discount to what South 32 has already paid. And we know that South 32 has had the benefit of doing significant due diligence in terms of the assets. So when you think about those things, and, and it doesn't even factor in a dollar, not even a dollar for the upside associated with the Bornite deposit, which is significant, and those other satellite deposits that I mentioned earlier, which we expect will increase the mine life uh, going forward. So we think there's a strong 
value proposition. As I said earlier, I personally purchased 375,000 shares uh, in the last two months, and I'll likely be adding to that position in the near term as well. And we still feel that uh, there's lots of value to be had with respect to the story and, uh, uh, and the assets that we have in terms of our interest in the Ambla Mining District. And a key milestone we should note is the approval of your road, the 211 mile Ambler Access Road. Uh, when will you be able to start building that? So that road, the record of decision was received uh, by ADA from the uh, BLM. So the way the road actually works, and it's very much modeled on uh, how Red Dog was developed. Uh, and Red Dog is uh, the largest zinc mine in the world. It's also in the Northwest part of the state. Uh, it's coincidentally, Nana is a partner in the Red Dog uh, mine. It's on Nana land. And we're very much modeling ourselves on Red Dog. So Red Dog had an arrangement with ADA where ADA built the road and financed the road, and they entered into a tolling arrangement for the use of a road and the port. So our model is exactly the same, except we're just focused on the road, not a port. And the idea here, and with the record of decision, BLM issued that to ADA. That was the final permit in the process. The next step now is to focus on detailed engineering. We have an existing MOU with ADA on funding a portion of a detailed engineering. It's not a significant portion. It's only a million dollars. They anticipate the detailed engineering engineering to cost about $70 million, of which we've indicated we would uh, we would be prepared to fund half of that $35 million. So we're in discussions with ADA to advance that memorandum of understanding and move that forward. So the next step would be to get that nailed down. Uh, from there, we're also looking at a tolling arrangement, which would set out what the financial obligations would be for the Arctic deposit as a starting point, because the idea behind the road is that it's there to support the development of a district. So it won't just be the Arctic mine, but in time, there'll be other mines that will be developed there. Could be Bornite, could be Sun, which is privately owned, could be Smucker, which is owned by Tech, could be other deposits that are found by other parties or developed. So um, when we're looking <clears throat> at our tolling arrangements, it's really with respect to the Arctic mine. In the FS, in the feasibility study that Trilogy produced, we assumed that we would pay $20 million in tolls a year uh, to ADA for use of a road. So over a 12-year mine life, that would assume, uh, assume $240 million. If we're able to extend that mine life through those other deposits, once they're permitted and uh, processed through um, Arctic, uh, we would be looking at, let's say, a 20 plus year mine life, in which case the tolls that would be paid to ADA would be roughly um, uh, uh, $400 million. Uh, so those are the steps. Uh, so the next steps in terms of a road development are get this MOU completed so that we can start to move forward on the uh, detailed engineering, uh, start to look at the tolling arrangement and seeing how the road syncs up with the permitting process and when construction of a road would actually need to begin because it really has to be aligned with the permitting process to allow us to, to move forward. It's important for people to understand that we need the road, but we need the road when the mine has been constructed. We don't need it sooner than that because at the end of the day, we need to get my, uh, su supplies and materials into the, into the area, but that can be done via ice road or via barging uh, those supplies up there. So the road doesn't need to be there tomorrow. It needs to align with when the mine's gonna be commissioned and operating because that's when we need to transport concentrate. So it's an ongoing process where we're having a strong, uh, good relationship with ADA. ADA is obviously a state agency and they're thinking about uh, the impacts uh, uh, to the state in terms of uh, future revenues and the ability to see the district uh, open up. And uh, we believe that we'll get to uh, a reasonable agreement with them uh, as, as we work through the discussions. Excellent. And one note on the 35 million that you would potentially contribute, would that be like a prepaid toll essentially? Yes, it would be a prepaid toll and or it would be set off against the tolling arrangements. And it, it really demonstrates in, in our mind, our commitment to, to advancing the project. And we believe by the way, that we're demonstrating that every single day when we spend $27 million uh, next year, I think underscores, and we've already spent you know, $150 million or has 
been spent in the district over time on exploration. So we think we've already demonstrated wholeheartedly how serious we are about moving forward. The, the other thing to point out, Bill, is that that $35 million would come from Ambler Metals LLC. So it wouldn't be funded by Trilogy per se, but it would come out of that $145 million. And we factored that in when we're looking at our timeline and how long that cash is going to last us so that uh, it still would factor in that we would be roughly 2024, 2025 in terms of the cash that we would have at the, um, uh, at the Arctic level. So there's definitely no dilution concern for investors here with Trilogy Metals, at least for a few years. No, we're in a great position. We've got roughly $13 million in cash on the, the balance sheet uh, at a corporate level. And um, we've transferred a number of our employees that were in Alaska now into the Amber Metals LLC. Our expenses have been a bit higher this year because we uh, formed the LLC. And so we had to uh, have uh, professional fees associated with the formation of that. We also completed the feasibility study so we paid for those expenditures we'll start to see the run rate on our costs come down as a result uh, on our gna uh, come down as a result um so yeah we feel like we're in a strong position and uh, you know as i said uh, when i look at the story we've got the benefit of having high grade deposits in a great jurisdiction in alaska you know, the picture behind me, by the way, is the Dalton Highway, which runs through the state and uh, our, uh, the road, uh, the, the Ambiat would uh, tie into this road. And this is what takes you to uh, Anchorage and the port that's there. Uh, so we're in the great state of Alaska. We're well supported in terms of uh, uh, the, the support that we have in the state. Uh, there's a great workforce there. There's a rich mining history, uh, extractive industry that's uh, there. I think we're very well positioned. We're well funded. We've got a great partner in South 32. We've got a great relationship with NANA. We're developing a strong relationship with ADA. We think uh, you know things are, are looking very positive for us. And you know we're convinced that this is a great opportunity for shareholders to come into the story, particularly given uh, the fact that we've underperformed a bit on the copper price and copper looks set to uh, move substantially higher. Trilogy's website, as I mentioned in the introduction, is trilogymetals.com. And the ticker symbol again is TMQ in Toronto and, and New York on the big boards. Tony, really appreciate the update. Thanks for coming on today's show. Bill, I appreciate the time and, uh, you know, I want to wish everyone uh, happy holidays, uh, uh, happy Thanksgiving in the U.S. and uh, look forward to providing future updates on uh, our uh, activities in Alaska and in the Ambler Mining District. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Mm -hmm.